All right, welcome AP Chemist to another lecture in our series. This is going to be the beginning of chapter five, an introduction to gas laws. Here we go. All right, so we are coming from our recent discussion of the condensed phases of matter in chapters 10 and 11. Uh, that is, we were talking about liquid and gas behavior, and in particular, the intermolecular forces of attraction between particles. We're gonna be moving on now to discussing gas behavior. Uh, gases inherently are significantly different than liquids and solids in that the particles themselves, primarily, are separated by much larger distances. And therefore, our understanding of gas behavior is going to be much less dependent upon factors like intermolecular forces of attraction, which diminish with increasing distance between particles, and are going to be more influenced by factors like pressure, which might change the relative separation of particles within the system. So primarily, over the course of our discussion here today, we're going to be looking at four distinct factors that influence gas behavior, uh, the first of which is the pressure, which we just mentioned, uh, second of which is the temperature of a system, which is fundamentally a measurement of the average kinetic energy of those particles, the third is the volume of the system, which, unlike for solid and liquid phase systems, is a variable which is easily manipulated or changed by either changing the container size in which the gas is contained or by manipulating the pressure of the system. And then last but not least is the number of particles of the gas in the system, which can be influenced by things like decomposition reactions producing more gas phase particles, or reactions which consume gas phase particles and as a result may lead to a decrease in the total number of gas phase particles present. So we'll treat these things kind of one at a time here, look at how they affect the other variables within the system. A lot of this conversation we're going to be having here today is going to be based upon things you've been introduced to last year in your introductory chemistry class. So Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in here to the discussion of the first variable that influences gas behavior, which is pressure. Uh, we define pressure as being a force exerted over a surface area. And if you consider for a quick moment here, a gas which is trapped within a sealed flask of some sort, we recognize that those gas particles are in constant random motion. And due to that constant random motion of those gas particles, they're going to be experiencing collisions not only with each other, but also with the surface of the container itself. And every time one of those gas particles collides with that surface of the container, it's going to push on a little bit, thus exerting a force. The collective force of all of those collisions of all those gas phase molecules divided by the surface area of the container would be fundamentally then a measurement of the pressure of that system. So again, pressure is a force exerted over a surface area. And you might be familiar with some pressure units that kind of directly link to that idea. In particular, if you've ever filled up like a basketball or something with a pump, you might have noticed that the pressure was being measured on your pump in units of pounds per square inch or PSI. Pounds being a unit of force and square inches being a surface area. Now, PSI is an imperial system unit, and as we're going to be working within the international system units for AP chemistry, um, we need to look at some uh, other units of measurement that are going to be more commonly used in our class. Uh, primarily, the international system, or SI unit, for uh, pressure is a pascal, where by definition, a pascal is one newton of force distributed over a surface area of one square meter, so a newton per square meter. A newton is a fairly small amount of force equivalent to about a quarter pound or so. Square meter is a pretty big surface area, so one pascal, as it turns out, is a very, very small uh, unit, incremental unit of uh, pressure. And as such, more commonly than not, you will see units of kilopascal um, in our class being, again, thousands of pascals. So Pascal is the SI unit. Other units we might commonly encounter would be things like atmospheres, where an atmosphere is approximately equal to the standard pressure in the atmosphere at sea level on a normal day. So kind of a uh, just baseline pressure level that we might compare things to um, in the world of atmospheric science. Um, you might see atmospheres. You also might see units of either millimeters of mercury or tor. Those are equivalent units of measurement, so kind of synonyms of one another. 
Um, we'll see where that unit of a millimeter of mercury comes from on our next slide when we have a discussion of manometers. And uh, down here below, I've given you a conversion factor between these different units of measurement. Uh, one atmosphere of pressure, that is normal standard atmospheric pressure at sea level, is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 torr, again, because those are equivalent units, um, and also equal to 101,325 pascal, or in kilopascal, that would be 101.325 kilopascal. And make sure you do pay attention to units throughout your problems we're working here. Uh, make sure you are uh, converting units appropriately so that you do not have a unit conver conversion issue within the equations we are going to be introducing on the next slides. All right, so that is pressure. Let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. That is how we are going to measure pressure. All right, continuing our conversation about the ability to measure pressure. You may recall from last year that the tool which we use as chemists to make pressure measurements is a device called a manometer. Those manometers come in two distinct varieties. Those are what we refer to as closed-ended manometers and open-ended manometers. A manometer is essentially made up of uh, two different glass components, the first of which is a glass bulb into which we are going to inject some amount of a gas phase species. And then on the right side of these diagrams here, you'll notice that I've got a tube of glass shaped like a U-tube. We literally call that a U-tube here. So we've got the glass bulb, which is affixed to a U-tube. The only difference between these two diagrams is that the monitor on the left side has a U-tube which is sealed, that is not exposed to atmospheric air. Whereas the open-ended manometer on the right-hand side there, you'll notice, is open to the atmosphere and thus is going to experience atmospheric pressure on that side of the U-tube. In between the bulb and the U-tube of the manometer, we generally place a liquid, and most commonly that liquid is going to be mercury, as mercury is a fairly dense liquid, it therefore will require a fairly large amount of pressure to push the column of mercury up or down within that U-tube in our system. Uh, let's take a look on the left side here first at the closed end manometer. So again, imagine we have our column of mercury, which is occupying the space inside of that U-tube. And then we're going to place into our manometer bulb using a valve of some sort. We're going to inject into there some amount of a gas phase species. And again, because that gas is going to be experiencing constant random motion, those gas phase molecules are going to be moving around within the manometer bulb. And in doing so, they're going to be colliding with each other, but also importantly, with the surface of the container. And that surface of the container includes the surface of the mercury in that U-tube. And as those collisions happen on that surface of the mercury, they're going to push downwards on that side, exerting a pressure. Now, on the opposite side, on the right side of our U-tube in this diagram, uh, there is a vacuum. And that implies, therefore, if there's a vacuum, there are no particles present whatsoever. And by definition, the amount of pressure that a vacuum would exert would therefore be a pressure of zero in any given unit, because if there are no collisions, there cannot be any pressure whatsoever. So, long story short, uh, we have molecules of gas pushing downwards on the left side of the column of mercury, nothing pushing downwards on the right side of the column of mercury, and as a result, that column of mercury is going to rise up, crawling upwards on the right side of our U-tube. We could at that point then simply measure the height at which that column of mercury rises to, and the pressure of the gas inside the bulb would be proportional to the height of that column of mercury. And as such, a unit of pressure would be, therefore, a measurement of millimeters of mercury that that column rises. So, for example, if the column were to rise up to a height of 500 millimeters on the right side, that would imply the pressure of the gas inside the bulb is 500 millimeters of mercury. Now, importantly to note here, folks, um, it appears in this system as if that column of mercury is being sucked up the right side of the tube. But uh, remember, in chemistry, nothing sucks because... If there is a vacuum present on the right side there, um, a vacuum is the absence of anything. And the absence of something cannot perform an action like sucking. So anytime we see something appearing to be sucked up the tube like it does in this system, really what's happening is it's being pushed from the opposite side. So there's a closed end manometer. Again, the height of the column of mercury is literally the pressure of the gas inside the bulb in units of millimeters of mercury. Now, in contrast, in an open-ended manometer, we have a slightly more complicated system. 
Again, we're going to inject a gas into the bulb on the left side of our diagram. And again, we're going to have a column of mercury, which is going to be separating the gas inside the bulb now from the right side of the U-tube, which is now exposed to atmospheric air. So in this case, what we have is kind of like a seesaw system where we have the gas inside the bulb exerting a pressure downwards on the left side of the column of mercury and atmospheric pressure on the outside pushing downwards on the right. If the pressure of the gas inside the bulb is greater than the pressure in the atmosphere, in that instance, the column of mercury will rise up the right-hand side and the difference in the height of the column of mercury from one side to the other now will not represent the absolute value of the pressure of the gas inside the bulb, but instead that height of the column of mercury rises will represent the difference in pressure from the bulb side to the atmosphere side within our system. So for example, if we saw a pressure of the gas inside the bulb of say 800 millimeters of mercury, and the pressure of the gas on the outside of the system, that is the atmospheric pressure outside, was standard atmospheric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. In that instance, the bulb pressure is 40 millimeters of mercury greater than the atmospheric pressure, and as such, the height of that column of mercury we would observe would be 40 millimeters higher on the atmospheric side than it was on the bulb side. Conversely, it's also possible for the column of mercury to rise up higher on the bulb side than on the atmosphere side. All that would then indicate is that the pressure would be greater on the atmospheric side than on the bulb side. And as such, just like a seesaw, we're pushing down harder on the right side, causing the column of mercury to rise up the left side. So rather than trying to memorize some sort of formula about when you add or subtract in terms of trying to find the actual pressure of the gas inside the bulb, what I would suggest to you is just to recognize that always within a manometer, the difference in pressure from the bulb side versus the atmosphere side is represented by the relative height of the column of mercury on one side to the other. So once you've recognized what the difference is, then just figure out where the pressure has to be higher or lower by thinking just logically in terms of what direction the uh, column of mercury is rising. And then just either add or subtract accordingly to make sure the value you're looking for um, ends up being either greater or less than the pressure that you know accordingly. So again, in an open tube manometer, the height of the column of mercury is now equal to the difference in pressure from the bulb side versus the atmosphere side of the manometer device. All right, um, that's that for manometers. Let's move on to our next slide. All right, at this point, we're now gonna go ahead and move into a discussion of the relationships between the variables that we described in terms of the variables affecting gas behavior. Uh, this is gonna be a couple days worth of actual first year chemistry here, kind of compacted into one lecture. So we're gonna be moving fairly quickly through this material as this is stuff that you have seen from last year's class. The first of the relationships we're gonna investigate here is the relationship we describe as Boyle's Law. Boyle's law describes the relationship between pressure and volume of a gas phase system as long as we are holding the temperature and the number of gas phase particles uh, in the system as a constant set of values. So the pressure volume relationship at constant temperature and number of particles, as it turns out, is an inverse relationship. And you may recall from last year during our gas properties lab an investigation of this law when we were using a sealed syringe uh, with some gas present in the syringe. Uh, recall in that process when we pushed inwards on the syringe or like in the diagram we have right here if we push down on that syringe plunger that pushes the gas phase particles closer together into a higher density state. In this higher density state, those gas particles are going to be experiencing more frequent collisions with both each other and the walls of their container. And as such, as the volume of that syringe decreases, the pressure exerted by the gas inside of that syringe is going to increase. And again, that relationship where an increase in one variable causes a decrease in the other or vice versa is by definition an inverse relationship. Now, mathematically speaking, the inverse relationship is described as the product of pressure times volume being equal to a constant value. And again, mathematically speaking, what that really means then is if pressure goes up to keep the product of P times V constant, uh, by definition, the volume must therefore go down in order to keep that product again a constant uh, product. 
in terms of graphing this relationship, uh, a pressure volume graph, not surprisingly, is going to look like an inverse curve where the pressure volume line that we're graphing there can get closer and closer and closer to either of those two axes, that is the y-axis here, which is the pressure axis, or the x-axis, the volume axis. But we can never actually cross either of those two axes. That is to say, there's an asymptote present at both the x and y axis. And again, that should make logical sense because, again, um, I cannot exert such a large pressure on the system that at some point I squeeze the volume into some sort of negative volume land because that would be, again, um, not an allowed uh, measurement within the system. You can't have negative volumes. And likewise, if the volume gets increasingly large, you would never see a point where the volume gets so large that the pressure changes from a positive value to a negative value, because that would imply when those particles strike the walls of the container, rather than pushing on it, they would instead pull. And so essentially the constraints of our system essentially limit us to the uh, first quadrant in our graph, and therefore um, that pressure volume relationship is an inverse graph. Um, another way of looking at that is that uh, the value of pressure is inversely proportional to volume. Uh, what that really means is, therefore, pressure increases as the value of 1 over volume increases as well. So if we were to graph this uh, graph as a pressure versus 1 over volume graph, in this case we would end up with a straight line linear relationship between that pressure and the inverse of volume. Uh, you may remember the formulas of those dual gas laws from last year's class. Uh, Boyle's law is generally formulated as the expression P1V1 equals P2V2, where the 1s represent the initial conditions of the system and the 2s represent the final conditions of the system. And again, just note here that that again represents an inverse relationship. Another way of saying that is that the initial product of pressure times volume is equal to the final pressure times the final volume, which is really just another way of formulating that idea that the product of pressure times volume is a constant for our system, as long as we don't alter the temperature or the number of particles. All right, so that's Boyle's Law, inverse relationship between pressure and volume, and we got that inverse relationship graph that we have now observed. We'll move on to our next relationship. All right, we've now discussed the inverse relationship between pressure and volume, which again was Boyle's Law. Our next relationship describes the relationship between volume and temperature assuming that we're holding pressure and number of particles constant within a system. Uh, this would be the type of experiment that you ran during your gas properties lab last year, where we took a balloon, which was free to expand and contract, and then placed that balloon into either hot or cold water baths, changing the temperature of the gas inside the balloon. And as you recall, when we placed that balloon into the hot water bath, the volume of the balloon increased. When you placed the balloon into the cold water bath, the volume of the balloon decreased. So that is to say, an increase in the variable of the temperature led to a corresponding increase in the volume of the system. That sounds very much like, by definition, a direct linear relationship. So a volume versus temperature graph would therefore yield a straight line graph um, in this type of system. Now, in order for this to work, recall that the temperature which we are measuring here must be in units of Kelvin. Kelvin being the absolute temperature scale, where the value of zero Kelvin represents the point at which there is no molecular motion whatsoever. And to understand why that's the case, let's take a little bit of a look at the math behind Charles' law. Uh, whereas Boyle's law told me that the product of pressure times volume was a constant, that was, again, an inverse relationship, Charles' law tells me that the ratio of volume over temperature must remain a constant. Or another way of saying that is, if you have V over T constant, if V goes up, T must have also gone up by the same proportional amount to keep that ratio of V over T the same value. Now, the mathematical formulation of this law is most commonly written as the expression I've written here, which is V1T2 equals V2T1. Or another way of stating that down below there is the ratio of V1 over T1 equals the ratio of V2 over T2. Or again, the ratio of volume to temperature remains constant for that system. Now, that being said, that should kind of make logical sense then that we should not be able to use measurements in either Celsius or Fahrenheit 
if we look at that formulation of this expression, because as we are familiar, um, in either the Fahrenheit or the Celsius temperature scales, you could end up with temperatures that are in the negative values. And recognizing that again, then in that equation, I could have an initial temperature, which was a positive value and a final temperature, which was a negative value. That would imply therefore that as that temperature decreased, the volume would have to then become, if we were measuring in Celsius, a negative volume to keep the ratio of V over T constant um, under those final temperature conditions. And again, that doesn't make any logical sense. You cannot have a negative volume of a system. You can't have less than any space that the system occupies. And therefore, negative temperatures seem like they'll yield nonsense answers when we try to manipulate this equation. So as a result, the only logical way of looking at this then would be that the units of temperature must always be positive values, um, which really means then that we would see the Kelvin temperature scale being the logical scale we must use when we're applying Charles' law. So that's the kind of logical idea here. Um, if you see an increase in the temperature, as long as you are measuring that temperature in Kelvin, uh, say a doubling of temperature would correspondingly result in a doubling of volume. That is a direct linear relationship between those two variables. All right, that's Charles' law. Let's move on to the next one. All right, the third of our gas laws now is the familiar Gay-Lussac law. We have now discussed the inverse relationship between pressure and volume in Boyle's law, the direct relationship between volume and temperature in Charles' law, and now we're going to be talking about the relationship between pressure and temperature, assuming we hold now the volume and the number of particles constant within a system. Uh, this particular lab here, folks, is one we also did uh, last year when, you recall, we measured the pressure inside of a sealed Erlenmeyer flask as we moved that flask from cold to lukewarm to hot water. And if you recall from that particular experiment, uh, the increase in temperature led to an increase in the frequency of collisions within the system and also the force per collision as those particles, as they get hotter, start to move on average faster inside of the flask. And as such, with increasing both frequency and force of collisions, we would then expect to see a corresponding increase in pressure as well. And that again sounds very much like a direct linear relationship. Temperature goes up, speed of particles increases, more collisions, harder collisions, pressure correspondingly goes up as well. Just like we saw for the previous slide and when we looked at Charles' law, in the Gay-Lussac law, we also must be measuring temperature in units of Kelvin for this proportional relationship to hold true. For the same logical reason, negative temperatures expressed within one of these equations here would also potentially result in negative pressure measurements. And again, a negative pressure would imply that things are sucking, and we know that sucking really isn't a thing. So nothing sucks um, in chemistry. Everything is going to be creating positive pressures due to the push from the collisions uh, as particles collide with each other. Um, as a direct linear relationship, again, the formulation of Gay-Lussac law is that P1 T2 equals P2 T1, or another way of stating that is the ratio of P1 over T1 is equal to the ratio of P2 over T2. And correspondingly, an increase in the temperature must result in a equivalent proportional increase in the pressure of the system. So looking at this graphically, if we graphed pressure versus the Kelvin temperature, we would again see a direct linear relationship that is a straight line graph in this system. Uh, interestingly here, folks, um, the idea that you could actually measure the um, point at which the pressure of the system would become zero by extrapolating your set of data you can measure allows us in this system to determine a predicted value of the temperature of absolute zero, um, that is the lowest possible temperature in the system where no collisions are occurring, resulting in a pressure of zero. And uh, you re might remember doing that in our lab last year where the m extrapolated value of absolute zero came out to be what we expected of a value of negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, again, or zero Kelvin. Um, 
I've given you here a set of graphs to kind of imagine here. Um, this set of graphs here you'll see um, is extrapolating backwards from a set of known measurement values um, at different volumes of our gas phase system there, um, where we change the temperature and see a corresponding decreases as we move to the left across each of these lines. As temperature goes down, pressure goes down. And you'll notice that each of those three extrapolated lines for our system at three different volumes all meet at the exact same point, that is the point at which all of those systems would have pressures of zero due to no molecular motion present in our system. And again, that value of zero Kelvin uh, represents the coldest possible temperature because you can't have less than no motion whatsoever in your system. All right, um, I've got a real quick particle picture level diagram here um, to try to describe the relationship we've talked about here for the Gay-Lussac law. On the left-hand side, I have some kind of room temperature air inside of a sealed flask at constant volume. And you'll notice inside of that, I'm gonna go ahead and diagram the particles uh, moving around inside of there. Those particles are not all moving the same speed because again, the motion within a gas phase system is random. But if you put a candle down below there to heat up the gas inside of your system, um, at that point, with the addition of energy to the system, on average, those particles will be moving faster, and we're going to represent that with, again, longer vector arrows showing faster-moving particles. And again, those faster-moving particles would expect to experience both more frequent collisions and a greater force per collision, correspondingly resulting in a larger pressure inside of that cylinder. All right, so we have now described all of the relationships between pressure, volume, and temperature. There's one additional variable that affects gas phase behaviors that we have not yet discussed, and that is what we'll see on our next slide when we look at Avogadro's law. All right, the last of our so-called dual gas laws that describe the relationships between two variables of the gas phase systems is what we refer to as Avogadro's law. Um, we've seen now the inverse relationship described by Boyle's law between pressure and volume, and then direct relationships for both volume temperature in Charles' law and pressure temperature for Gay-Lussac law. The last one here should really fundamentally be called the law of the incredibly obvious. That is the relationship between the moles of gas phase particles and the volume. Not surprisingly, if you take a soccer ball and you add more gas into it, the volume of that soccer ball gets bigger. So again, logically speaking, an increase in the number of particles leads to an increase in the volume, as long as you hold the pressure and the temperature of the system constant. That again sounds like another direct relationship, and as such, it's going to follow the same format as the other direct relationships we've seen in Charles Law and Gay-Lussac as well. That is to say, the ratio of volume to number of moles is itself a constant value. Formulating this here would be the expression N1V2 equals N2V1, where N, again, is the number of particles and V is the volume of the system. Now, importantly here, folks, um, the number of particles could be measured in literally numbers of moles. It could be measured in numbers of molecules. It could be numbered in numbers of atoms of a... Um, let's say like a noble gas or something, but also you could actually use as a stand-in for N a mass of the gas phase particles present in the system as long as the gas is not changing identity during the course of the experiment. So that is to say, if you only have one gas, like say you're filling your ball with nitrogen or something, um, in that case you could just use um, mass and moles interchangeably because, again, the conversion factor from grams to moles would be the same on both sides of your equation, and therefore that conversion factor would essentially just cancel out. So mass can be used in Avogadro's law as long as you're not changing identities of species. Um, again, one final way of looking at this, the ratio of volume to moles under the initial set of conditions, that is V1 over N1, must be equal to the ratio of volume to moles under the final conditions, that is V2 over N2. Just another way of stating that the ratio of volume over moles remains constant in your system. And as such, that relationship, again, graphically speaking, would be a direct linear relationship. That is, as moles of gas goes up, the volume of the gas goes up as well. And that is the last of our dual gas laws. On the next slide, we're going to look at how we can combine these gas laws together to come up with a more universally applicable expression in the combined gas law. In the combined gas law, we're going to be 
essentially combining together the direct relationships described by Charles and the Gay-Lussac law um, with the inverse relationship was, was described in Boyle's law. So to kind of derive what this is going to look like here, let's just start off with the expression we learned earlier, which was Boyle's law, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. That is to say, the product of pressure times volume itself remains a constant value. Now, if that product of pressure times volume is a constant, um, if you imagine keeping pressure constant for a quick moment here, that is ignore P1 and P2, Charles Law stated that the ratio of volume over temperature itself was also a constant ratio as well. That was V1 over T1 equaled V2 over T2. So therefore, if P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2, and V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2, if I combine those two things together, I would get this new expression, which is P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And notice that as I write it this way, it implicitly also includes the relationship described by Gay-Lussac laws as well. Because remember, in the Gay-Lussac law, we said that we had to keep the number of moles of particles and volume constant. So if a volume is held constant, then V1 would be equal to V2. And this would then simplify down simply to then P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. That again describes the direct relationship between pressure and temperature. So within this expression, we would then see essentially all three of those dual gas laws, that is Charles law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, Gay-Lussac law, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, and that inverse relationship from Boyle's law, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So this really fundamentally is truly the only gas law you would need out of those, as long as you're not going to be changing the number of moles of particles in your system. As we saw before with the previous gas laws for Charles and Gay-Lussac. The temperature of this system, however, must be expressed in units of Kelvin for these proportional relationships to make logical sense. So again, always recall to convert into units of Kelvin. If you are given units of degrees Celsius, remember there is an easy conversion factor between the two. That is all you need to do is to take your Celsius temperature and add 273.15 to get your Kelvin temperature. All right, so that is the combined gas law. On our next slide, we're going to be looking at the most universally applicable gas law, which is what we refer to as the ideal gas law on our final slides here. All right, to introduce the ideal gas law to you, I want to kind of contrast where you might see this being useful in comparison to those previous dual gas laws and combined gas law that we have been dealing with up until this point. All the previous expressions which we have derived have really compared initial conditions of a system versus final conditions of a system, so we can use proportional relationships between those different variables to understand how a system might change in one variable if you make a change in the other. Now, this last one I'd like to do here is rather than looking at kind of a before and after expression, instead I'd look to, like to look just at the current state of the gas. That is, I want to be able to understand how pressure, volume, moles, and temperature all relate to the current system itself, rather than some sort of before and after relationship. To start with how we're going to do this, let's go back all the way to the first gas law we introduced, which was Boyle's law. Boyle's law told us that the product of pressure times volume itself was a constant. That is to say, those two variables were inversely related to one another. So I'm going to start here by expressing P times V for a gas phase system is constant. Now, if I ignore for a quick moment here pressure and look at the volume temperature relationship described by Charles law, I knew that the ratio of V over T was a constant ratio because the relationship between those two variables, as long as you hold pressure and moles constant, was a direct relationship. So at this point, we have the expression pressure times volume divided by temperature must equal a constant value. Last but not least, let's consider the relationships described in Avogadro's law. Recall Avogadro's law ignored pressure and temperature because we're going to hold those variables constant. Avogadro's law said that the ratio of volume divided by moles itself was a constant ratio. That is, volume and moles were themselves directly related as well. So combining all of those different relationships together here, I get a mathematical expression which tells me the product of pressure times volume divided by moles times temperature 
itself should be a constant value. And in our equation, if you recall from last year, that ratio is, as it turns out, defined as the ideal gas constant, which gets the symbol R in our expression. So we now have PV over NT equals a constant R. We could rearrange that equation in the format you're more familiar with, which is the familiar pivnert, that is PV equals NRT. Now, before we go ahead and start using this equation, let's derive some values for that constant R and think about what it really fundamentally means. Again, that constant R was the ratio of pressure times volume divided by moles times temperature. So imagine for a moment here that I have one mole of a gas phase system, like a mole of, say, helium gas. And let's say that the pressure that that gas phase system is under is at a pressure of one atmosphere, and it is at a temperature of 273.15 Kelvin. Those are, by definition, standard temperature and pressure conditions. As it turns out, I chose this particular amount because you are familiar with the volume that this amount of gas would occupy under those conditions. Recalling all the way back to our days of the mole map, remember that one mole of gas under STP conditions occupies a volume of 22.4 liters of space. So with that then set of measurements, I could then plug in those pressures, volumes, moles, and temperatures into my ratio PV over NT and solve for a value of the gas constant R. So plugging in pressure of one atmosphere, volume of 22.4 liters divided by one mole of gas times our temperature T of 273.15 Kelvin. If we plug in those values into our PV over NT expression, we determine a constant of 0 0.08206, and those units would be liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So a derived value of the gas constant R is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Now, remembering that we have various different pressure measurements systems that we often use in chemistry, that is, we don't always measure in atmospheres, but often in millimeters of mercury or kilopascal, it would be useful to us if we could go ahead and derive a value of the gas constant defined in those different pressure units, so we don't always have to go back and convert everything into atmospheres uh, for every one of our calculations. So let's derive the values of the gas constant R in those other pressure units. If I use units of millimeters of mercury for my pressure, recall standard pressure of one atmosphere is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. And again, we're going to plug in the rest of our variables, which don't change, that volume of 22.4 liters, one mole of gas, and temperature of 273.15 Kelvin. In this unit of measurement, the constant we derive comes out to be a value of 62.4, and now my units are liter millimeter of mercury per mole Kelvin. We can do the exact same thing now for units of kilopascal. Um, standard pressure in kilopascal, recall, was 101.325 kilopascal times our 22.4 liters divided by one mole times 273.15 Kelvin. In this unit of measurement, our value of the gas constant R turns out to be 8.3145 liter kilopascal per mole Kelvin. So we now have our ideal gas equation, PV equals NRT. Um, given any set of three of those four variables, you can solve for the other one missing in that equation by just a simple rearrangement um, algebraically of your equation. And we've done lots of those during last year. Um, for our final slide here, let's take a look at how we might manipulate this ideal gas law in a couple of ways that allow us to determine kind of interesting measurements within an analytical chemistry laboratory. All right, this is our final slide for this lecture here. Uh, we're going to be looking now at how we can use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, which we derived on our previous slide in order to make some clever manipulations to allow us to do some analytical chemistry. So what we're going to look at here is a kind of little bit of algebraic manipulation of some equations, particularly starting with the definition of a molar mass. Uh, recall, molar mass by definition is the mass of a substance divided by the number of moles present in the system. It is again in units of grams per mole. 
So starting with that definition of molar mass being equal to grams divided by moles, I could then rearrange that expression to say that I could find the number of moles of a substance by dividing the mass in grams by the molar mass in units of grams per mole. So again, moles in my expression n is equal to grams divided by molar mass. I'm going to go ahead and take that expression then and substitute in grams over molar mass into my ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT, for the variable n, that is moles. Making that substitution yields a new expression, which is pressure times volume, PV, is now equal to moles, which I'm substituting now as grams divided by molar mass, times the gas constant R times the temperature T. So I now have the expression PV equals grams over molar mass times RT. And at this point, I can just simply rearrange this expression to solve for the molar mass of a gas. That is, multiplying both sides of my equation by molar mass to get molar mass out of the denominator, and then dividing both sides of the equation by PV yields my new expression, which is molar mass is equal to GRT divided by PV. And you can see all of a sudden why this could be a very, very useful tool to a chemist when dealing with some sort of unknown gas phase species. Um, thinking about what you can measure in a laboratory, it's certainly possible to measure the pressure using a manometer of a gas. You can measure the volume of a gas because, recall, the volume of a gas is equivalent to the volume of its container. And you can measure the temperature of gas very easily with a thermometer. The gas constant R is a constant, so I don't need to measure that at all. And really also the last variable in this expression now is grams, and you can measure the mass of a gas as well. It's a trickier thing to do than measuring the mass of a solid or a liquid because that gas is uh, held upwards by buoyant forces. But using a little bit of clever laboratory technique, you can measure the mass of a gas if you account for that buoyancy. And as such, we can measure G, T, P, and V, which means by easily measurable variables within a laboratory setting, you can determine the molar mass of an unknown gas. And as it turns out, molar mass is a very, very useful tool for identifying a species in terms of what unknown you might be dealing with within your experiment. So this expression is essentially a tool that allows me to identify gas phase species. Now, that being said, as you recall last year, please be very, very careful in using this expression because many gas phase species we deal with happen to be diatomic elements, in particular things like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, or even bromine vapor as well. So all of those, again, being diatomics means you've got to watch out because the molar mass which you measure might be the molar mass not of a gas phase atom, but instead of a gas phase diatomic molecule. So keep that in mind as you're using this uh, as a identification tool. We can likewise also do another quick representation here, which is starting with the equation we, equation we just derived, that is molar mass equals GRT divided by PV. Notice in here that on the right side of my expression, I have grams divided by volume, which really then is measurement of mass over volume, which is density. So this expression could also be uh, written as molar mass is equal to density times gas constant R times the temperature T, divided by the pressure P. And that brings to mind a very, very important idea, which is to say that molar mass and density are directly related to one another for a gas phase system as described by this ideal gas law, which again kind of makes logical sense. That is to say, if you think about some gases you're familiar with that are very, very low density, things like hydrogen or helium, those things have very, very small molar masses correspondingly. That should kind of make logical sense because you might recall from last year in our discussions of kinetic molecular theory, those gas phase particles are separated by large distances, which really means equal volumes of gases contain equal numbers of particles. And if those particles are more massive per particle, it would therefore make logical sense that equal volumes of gas would contain a greater mass if the particles themselves were more massive as well. So long story short, we have a couple of new manipulated expressions here for variations of that ideal gas law. Um, these variations of the ideal gas law are not found on the equation sheet for the AP chemistry test, which means if you're thinking that they might be useful, you either should commit them to memory or remember the manipulation we did by substituting grams divided by molar mass. You can derive them yourself um, during the course of the test if you prefer that as well.
All right, that's pretty much it for our introduction to gas laws. Thanks for listening. We'll move on to our next lecture.